Hello, this short video is intended to run through some of the most important aspects to think about when you're writing multiple choice questions in order for them to be both effective in assessing the learners and that the results are going to be um, psychometrically sound. Writing good questions is definitely something that's a learnt skill, not instinctive. The good news is it's not that difficult to learn the basic rules to improve your question writing. Before you even start writing a question on a topic, this is a, a, the most important question. Is it really worth evaluating? Asking learners to recall esoteric facts and percentages of instance diseases, etc., is often not really worth asking. So, you know, don't waste your time asking questions that aren't really important in our daily practice. I don't know if you're familiar with Bloom's taxonomy of learning objectives, but we really want our learning objectives to be near the top of this pyramid. So we want to be asking questions that test evaluation or synthesis or anal analysis of knowledge rather than just do they understand it and can they recall some fact. And the American Board of Radiology aims to have... Um, greater than 90% of its questions in this top four parts of Bloom's taxonomy. Each of um, these levels in Bloom's taxonomy has some verbs that are associated with it that you can use in your questions or to think of your questions. Um, and you can easily search for this on the internet if you want to look at it further. So let's look at how an individual question is broken down. It was broken down into four parts, the stem, the lead-in statement, the answer options, and then the key answer, and I'm going to go through these in turn. So the STEM is typically presented as a very short clinical case scenario um, for the exams of the American Board of Radiology and also for boards, uh, exams for National Board of Medical Examiners for medical students. Keep this very short, um, and this should be a linear presentation. So, for example, a 50-year-old man presents to the emergency room with abdominal pain, a CT scan was performed. What do I mean by linear presentation? So, first of all, the sex and the age, any relevant past medical history, then the presenting signs and symptoms, then what test was done, obviously for us it's usually an imaging procedure, and then the lead-in question. Um, this is cognitively the easiest way for people to read a question and not skip important parts of the information. So this would be an example of a non-linear presentation of a question. A CT scan was performed on a 32-year-old man who presented to the emergency room with abdominal pain. He has a long history of alcohol abuse and we try to avoid this kind of a um, stem. The lead-in is the question. And this could be either in the form of a question or an open statement. So a question would be, what is the most likely diagnosis? Or an open statement is, the most likely diagnosis is, or which of the following is the most appropriate? Um, if you use one of those latter two types, the open statement, the answers should always complete the question. So often it's easier to just put it in the form of a question, to my mind. So very typical lead-ins um, for us as imagers would be what is the most likely diagnosis? What is the best interpretation? What is the most likely cause of these findings? What is the most appropriate cause of this clinical situation? And so on. If normal is one of your answers, then you should use what is the best interpretation as opposed to what is the most likely diagnosis because normal is not really a diagnosis. The distractors are the wrong answers. Um, usually you have three or four um, wrong answers, giving you a total of four or five total answer options. It doesn't have to be that number. There's no magic about that number. But you certainly you want to try and avoid having less than four answers in total. The only time you can really have three is if there's no other option. For example, it's um, less than, equal to, or more than, or increase stays the same and decreased. The wrong answers need to be plausible and that's really, you know, that's really important. Don't just toss in something that clearly cannot possibly happen um, and they need to be very homogeneous which we'll talk about in a moment. Ideally you want these distractors to range from you know not at all likely or extremely unlikely to less likely than the correct answer because that that mimics real life. You know when we're looking at a CT scan and there's an abnormality there's a bunch of different things it could be, 
Some of them are not very likely, and then there's one that's the most likely. And you want that most likely one to be, you know, kind of a significant step ahead of the others in likelihood. The distractors should all be similar in length and the format, and they should be balanced. So, for example, if you have um, two which use the word increased, you want to have two which have the word decreased within them. The key is the correct answer. So we can identify this when you're writing a question with a, and submitting it for an exam board with an asterisk or written underneath, it says key equals A. Um, this might be the only one correct answer, or in some cases, it's the most correct answer when the others are possible but significantly less likely. And obviously, this will depend on how you phrase your lead-in. Some, some general rules to question writing. Keep the stems and the distractors as short as possible. Don't put in unnecessary words and unnecessary information. It's just going to mean that it's going to distract the test takers from the important information there. It's really important that there is no ambiguity in the interpretation of this question. And when you look at the question, and for um, image-based questions, can they answer the question without even looking at the image? You know, it's not a good question if they can answer it without looking at the image. Here's an example of a question that if you're a smart test taker and you're used to looking at the clues in questions, you can answer. So this was a obviously an image-based question with ultrasound, um, which I'm not showing you. You don't need the ultrasound because what do you look at? You look at common words. There's kidney, 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 this is kidney, and kidney. So we know that kidney is going to be in the answer. Then we look and we say, okay, the stone, stone, there's three instances of stone, so I'm going to look for one for stone with it. There's um, heterogeneous mass appears three times. So I'm going to look at the commonalities of this, and I'm going to come out and say, all right, the most occurrences of these common elements appears in D, and guess what? This is the right answer for this particular question. So with an image-based question, you want them to have to look at the image to be able to get the right answer. There's a second important test, and this um, is for both image and non-image-based questions, which is, can it pass the cover test? In other words, if you cover up the answer options, not the image, but you cover up the answer options, can they answer that question? Um, if they were smart, knowledgeable test taker. So, for example, which, is, which of the following is the most common type of breast cancer? You shouldn't need to see the options to be able to answer that question. And I'm going to show you some examples of uh, questions that fail the cover test later on. We want to try and make the distractors as short as possible. So if there's common terms within the answers, move them into the lead-in. So here, you know, there's this common term cerebral artery in each of the answers. So what can we do? So we can take out uh, cerebral arteries and move it into the stem. Instead of, instead of saying which of the following vessels has been occluded, we can say which of the following cerebral arteries has been occluded and hence make the answers shorter. Over the years, a variety of different answer formats have been used um, but now these have been whittled down to really um, very few, and they're really variations of only one answer format. And that's a single positive answer. So an example of a single positive answer would be a lead-in which says, which the following is the most likely cause of this abnormality? So the answers are all positive, not negative. There are a couple of other um, somewhat more complicated answer formats which are accepted, but really they're all based on this. I'm not going to go into them um, in this short talk. I do, however, want to show you some of the invalid formats um, which people often write questions in. I'm not going to talk about why these are invalid. If anybody wants more information about why psychometrically these don't score well, in exams, um, then I would suggest you read either the American Board of Radiology or the NBME exam writing guide. You should not write um, items that have negative stems. So which of the following is the least likely to present as an abdominal mass? Or all of the following are true except. Um, and you know why are these bad? Because many exam takers will miss 
these key words here. They know the information, but they will get the answer wrong because they look for the which of the following is the most likely to present as an abdominal mass, or they miss out the accept and see all of the following are true, and so on. You can, however, use which of the following are contraindicated. That's considered to be okay. Similarly, you want to avoid having negative terms within the answer stem. So, which of the following statements regarding breast cancer is true? And the answer stem here says it is not the most common cause of cancer in women. How do people read that? They read it as it is the most common cause of cancer in women. You should not use questions that have multiple correct answers, which are really multiple true-false. Which of the following diseases might cause this finding select one or more? So you should have single positive answers. Similarly, true-false questions, such as identify which of the following answers are true statements. Um, these have been used in the past. They're no longer used in national exams. And if we're, they're not used in national exams, we shouldn't be using them in our um, test writing for our learners. Don't use all of the above, A, B, C, D, and all of the above. We all know this. You know, we've, we've taken many of these tests, and we know that if we see that A and B are true, then we just skip to E. We don't even have to think about C and D. An old exam type that used to be used are the ones that were A, B, and C, and then A and B, A, B, and C, and so on. Again, don't use these. I just want to run through a few of the common mistakes that I see. I've done a, a an awful lot of exam item editing, and these are ones that come up again and again. Don't use inconsistent units. The units here, and you can see I've got millimeters, centimeters, micrometers, you want to have the same units for each of the answers. And not only that, but you want to put them in numerically increasing order of uh, size. Don't have um, numerical values that overlap. So you know, in this particular case, if the learner thinks that the answer is 5%, is he going to choose answer A or is he going to choose answer B? So make sure it's something like 0 to 5%, 6 to 10, you know, 11 to 15, and so on. Keep the answers homogeneous. They need to be focused, so therefore they may should be, the answer should be all diseases, or they should be all artifacts, or they should be all numerical, or they should be... Um, all uh, physical findings and so on, um, rather than a mixture of the others, and I'll show you an example in a minute. And, it, and in this, this is going to help you pass the cover test. So here's an example of unfocused or heterogeneous answers. If you look at these here, um, this is a statement about the disease, uh, as is this, this is a radiographic finding, um, this is a radiation dose. These are very heterogeneous answers, and not only that, but this does not uh, pass a cover test. You know, if you covered up these answers, you cannot answer this question, however brilliant you are. So this is an example of focused answers. Uh, which of the following is the most common type of breast cancer? So these are all uh, pathological diagnosis. They all fill into one homogeneous category. And not only that, but it passes the cover test. If I covered up these answers, you should know the answer if you knew the information. Try and keep all of the answers the same length. Um, we have a tendency to write a much longer answer for the correct option than we do for the incorrect options because we spend a lot more time thinking about that and then we kind of toss in the others. So that's part of cluing. We're cluing the uh, readers of this exam that this is the correct answer here and the others which are much shorter are the incorrect ones. And you can falsely clue this as well. So, you know, people who are good test takers will look either uh, consciously or unconsciously for that longer answer and can be fooled if you're not keeping them the same length. And you can usually rewrite ones um, to be pretty much the same length fairly easily. If you can't, then have, you know, perhaps two that are longer and two that are shorter or three that are longer and two that are shorter and so on. If you're using lead-ins which are not in the form of a um, question but in the form of completion of a sentence, you need to make sure they're grammatically correct. So the most likely cause of this abnormality is metastatic renal cancer. That works. Myeloma works. Fibro dysplasia works. But the most likely cause of this abnormality is needs correlation with radiography does not work and immediately clues 
the exam taker that that is an incorrect answer. Be very careful with um, relative and absolute terms. So relative terms such as sometimes, occasionally, usually, they're extremely imprecise. And you know, th there's many studies that have looked at um, one person's interpretation of these terms compared to the, another person's. And the correlation coefficients are extremely low. Um, some people think that sometimes is 10% of the time, and other people think that sometimes is 70% of the time. So avoid using these. And similarly, terms such as always, never, and must be, absolute terms, we all know that that never happens. I mean, there's nothing that's never and nothing that's always. Um, so we will immediately exclude those as being uh, viable options. There are some subtle aspects of cluing um, that you may not be aware of, although I'm, I'm betting that you've actually subconsciously used them when you've taken your own exams, um, such as repeating uh, one or more word, either in the stem and the answers or in more than two answer options, kind of like I showed you with that case of the renal and liver masses previously. So here's an example here. A 60-year-old man arrives in the emergency room in ventricular fibrillation. After resuscitation, a cardiac CT scan is performed. What is the most likely diagnosis? And here is the word ventricular repeated again um, in this particular patient. Obviously, I'm not showing you the image, but that clues you to look for um, that ventricular may be more likely. Same history here, but in this case, the word atrial is repeated in two of the answers, and that's going to clue you that it's either atrial lipoma or atrial myxoma is the correct answer. What are some ways of getting around this? Well, you can repeat the same terms in what's called match pairs. So this, there's ventricular twice here, and there's atrial twice. There is no cluing in this as to whether we're going to point towards ventricular or atrial. Additionally, what I've done is I've taken ventricular out of the stem and I've just put in cardiac arrest which is um, just as useful information in the stem. There's times where you need to may need to do instead of two match pairs three match pairs in this case ventricular, atrial and then cardiomyopathy are all matched and again this is a very balanced question. These are all diagnoses as well so they're very homogeneous answers and if you had the scan there it passes the cover test because by covering up all the answers, you should still be able to interpret the image and come up with the correct response. Don't teach in the STEM. This is we're assessing, not teaching. So invasive lobular cancer can present as architectural distortion, right? This is teaching. It shouldn't be there. So this was a pretty brief go through of the salient points in item writing, but these are well worth taking into consideration when you write your items, they're going to perform psychometrically much better. What I mean by perform psychometrically much better, it means that they are valid assessors of your exam taker's abilities. Um, there are a couple of good resources for this. The ABR, um, you can contact, they have a very nice manual on item writing. You can also find this at the AUR website. If you go to the ACER section of that website, you'll find it under the item writing resources there. Um, the NBME item writing guide, which is longer, um, but you only actually have to read like the first third of it and you'll get most of what I'm talking about, as well as some of the um, cognitive background on why these things should be done like this, um, is a nice guide um, that can be freely downloadable from the NBME website. If you just uh, Google NBME item writing guide, you'll find it. Hope this helps. Bye.